how 15% of the 20% who end up here are supposed to respond uh, appropriately to this instruction. 5% don't and get kicked up into level three, which is one-on-one -on -one instruction. So you're increasing the uh, intensity as you move up, and I don't know about the frequency, whether they do it during their reading block or not. Um, again, we try to maximize both the intensity and frequency by double dosing here. So this is the public school model, this is the Groves model. Looks the same, except I would argue our quality core instruction is evidence-based, that we our tier two is individual instruction, So because our reading groups are so small here, that we'll put, kick them right into individual instruction. And then tier three, we know that on the continuum of dyslexia, you can be significantly impacted on this end, you could be minimally impacted on this end, and we know that about 4% of kids will never become fluent readers because of their wiring issue. It's not an intelligence issue, it's a wiring issue. I just want to add uh, to quality core instruction, in addition to using a scientifically based uh, uh, reading curriculum, you really need very well trained teachers um, because uh, reading, the best reading curriculum um, has to be taught with craft and fidelity. And so we, we, we put a high value on, on uh, professional development of teachers, otherwise I wouldn't have a job here. So. So um, and I'm really glad I have a job here. So. <laughs> the teachers here say, they get so sick of us talking about fidelity, making sure we do things the way they're supposed to be done. They get so tired of it, they call it their F word. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. On your previous slide with the public school system, at the point that they're getting one-on-one -on -one instruction, I'm assuming that's pretty rare. Yeah. And plus, you're really not going to get extra help until that child falls. My understanding is two years behind in the yeah. first place. This is very much a hypothetical okay. arrangement here. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that it's happening in, uh, in locally. Um, there is a really good organization that is in um, a lot of Minneapolis public school, schools. It's in, and they're in schools all across Minnesota. It's called Minnesota Reading Corps. And they do a lot of work, and they do a wonderful job. But they're they're working with such a small number of kids compared to all who need it. So this is you know very much hypothetical. In general, though, the idea of response to intervention is that they don't have to fall two years behind yeah. to qualify yeah. for services. I mean, the idea of response to intervention too is it will cut down on special education referrals because using database regular ongoing progress monitoring like Ames Weber Dibbles, you'll find those children who are falling in the lowest 30th percentile and you'll be able to double dose them and so on um, quicker. So that, you know, and and I've seen that happen in a there in a in schools in a school in New York City in Brooklyn where almost 100% of the kids are on free and reduced lunch and they have no special ed referrals because they do it so well. So it does happen. I don't know why it doesn't happen everywhere. Uh, but because, I can answer that, because <laughs> reading is based on, on erroneous and passionate um, belief systems. Mm -hmm. okay? in, incorrect belief systems in higher education. That's the show. Okay, so what happens then if what happens then if you use this model that we described tonight? You use it with fidelity. This is what can happen. This is the gray silent reading test. We administer this every fall to new students, and then every April and May thereafter to <coughs> all the students. In we'll just take 2011. It, the students coming to us um, in 2011 had um, an average rate of growth in reading, in comprehension, the most important reading test you can give, of just over half a year of growth 
um, per year. In 2010, it was just over half, and same in 2009. So a little stronger. Our kids coming in this year, last year were a little stronger readers uh, than the previous two years. But still, they're reading at just over half of a year. So how do we get that? We took um, whatever their reading level was on the test, let's say a, 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 um, a student coming into us as a sixth grader um, scored uh, a grade equivalency of, of 3.0 on his reading tests in the fall. You take that number and you divide it by the number of years the kid's been in school. So he, he finished fifth grade, he's been in school six years, kindergarten through fifth grade. So three divided by six is 0.5. Right? So on average, that's where our kids are. After one year at Groves, they're making just over two. So here, the gap every year is growing, right? Because they're not doing a full year. That gap, every year they're in school is getting bigger from where they are to where they should be. And we, the coming to Groves, our job is to close the gap, to get that back up to where the skills should be. So this is all students. And the reason I put all students in here is because not all of our students are dyslexic. Okay? Some of them are, are pretty good readers but struggle with ADHD and executive function skills and so forth. When we disaggregate the, the data and we look at students with just reading difficulties, and we define a reading difficulty as less than 0.7 years of growth in a year. When we look at just kids with reading difficulties, look at this. They're approaching 2.5 years. What do they have coming in? They're, they're progressing at less than half of a year per year at school, and in one year it grows 2.5. And look how significantly different this growth is than their first year students in 2010 or 2009. So what did we attribute this to? We attributed it to a couple different things. First of all, the literacy framework went into place what year? Last year for the first time? Okay, so the literacy framework is new, and we brought two new literacy curriculum in, curricula in last year, um, and we really started stressing fidelity. Okay, so it's a nice trend line that we have going. And we'll be doing this each subsequent year. I expect to see, as we get more and more refined and polished in our literacy delivery, I expect to and keys to literacy coming in. I hope to see that continue to climb. So is this measuring first grade through 12th grade? Yep, first graders through 12th grade. Do you have more grade schoolers coming in? Our, we have three divisions at school, first through sixth, our lower school, seven and eight, our middle school, and nine through 12, our upper school. The division of the greatest growth by far um, is our lower school, which is the way it should be, the way we want it to be, because the earlier we can catch kids, the quicker we can turn them around. When we get a seventh or eighth grader or ninth grader coming in, there's so much emotional baggage because of this failure in school. They want to be in control of their own failure, so uh, they just shut down and don't, they don't go for it because they've been wrong so often. So now, just a couple of fun things to do before we close tonight. Um, this is a spelling mistake that this child has made. What do you think he was trying to spell? Train. Wow, that's impressive. <laughs> Most people say crane. Okay, and, and then I go back on it and I'll say, uh-huh, I got you, because the spelling error that this child is making is not a visual error. It's, it's actually a phonological, it's a sound error. When you, may, when you say the word train, say the word train. Do you say t -t -t terrain or do you say ch train? So this, this is a great spelling mistake. He's right. That's the way it sounds. That's the way it feels on your lips or in your mouth. Because these sounds are not made in isolation. Two consonants coming together like that, the, the R is affecting the pronunciation of the T in front of them. How do you make the sound of R? Look at my lips. How do you make T? -t, 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 -t. So in preparation of the R sound, 
the T is being rounded in your mouth. It's coming out as train. So it's a perfectly natural phonological phenomenon that's happening. And the, and the child's representing that in the stone. But if a teacher doesn't know where that spelling error is coming from, how in the world do you correct it? Right? How would you correct that? How would you help the child with that? I would do the same thing that I'm doing with you. I would show him, 